hands and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit divine, we ask the Lord, you come and you made the word, the word real to us. Let your presence fall upon us. Give us eyes of understanding, heart of understanding. Help us to perceive and to know your word and your presence. Open our eyes to see the times and the seasons in which we live. Let your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight, I just want to welcome all our friends and family that are joining us for tonight's um, Bible study. Um, just want to welcome you and uh, say God bless you to every one of you that is joining us for the first time. Um, just to recap, um, we've been going through the book of Revelation right from chapter 1, going through verse by verse from chapter 1, and we are in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, and um, we're going to go straight into Revelation chapter 13. Now, one Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 um, to be read. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. God bless you. Um, I'm going to take my time, and um, it's locked down, and you don't have to go and stand at the bus stop and catch a bus. And you're not in a hurry to go anywhere unless you just want to go and watch TV. By the times and the seasons, we are a paramount that um, we understand where we are and we understand the word of God. In Revelation chapter 13, we are told that a beast came out of the sea. Now, the thing about the book of Revelation is it has a lot of parables. It has a lot of images. It has a lot of animal images. And most of the time, people try to go to the book of Revelation to try and understand it. And any time anybody tries to go to straight on to the book of Revelation, read and interpret it, you get into trouble. Because... The books of the Bible are interconnected for you to be able to understand and have a better picture of what the Bible is saying. And I want to read um, Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 again. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven herds and ten horns, and upon, the t uh, upon his horns, Ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, you will notice that in the scripture we are told that the beast came out of the sea. Now, that is prophetic language that the beast came out of people. Most of the time, when the Bible mentions the sea, is a representation of a population. He came out of a population, but the the, the covenant of the beast is with the sea. That the where the secret of the beast is with the sea, the literal sea. Now, to be able to understand what this beast is, the beast there represents the Antichrist, the Antichrist. That most people think the whole book of Revelation is about the Antichrist. No, the book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 tells us the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the book is not about the revelation of the Antichrist. It's about the revelation of Jesus Christ. But then there is a man that will rise up in the world who is known as the Antichrist. And then 
his spirit is known as the spirit of the Antichrist. Is everything okay? His spirit is known as the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, to understand what the seven heads and the ten horns the Bible interprets itself. You don't need a private interpretation to understand the Bible. Now, the scripture I've just read, an angel of the Lord came to John the Apostle and he told John the Apostle what the meanings of the seven heads and the ten horns was about. Now, I wanted to take, open your Bible to Revelation chapter 17, verse 9 to 13, and I read. And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And there are seven kings, five are fallen and one is. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Verse 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh. And goeth into perdition. And the ten horns where thou sowest are ten kings which have received no kingdom yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now, the seven heads is talking about seven major empires that have come in the world. Six of them, five of them have already come and gone. And the sixth one is no more, but will be revised. Now I want to mention who, what these seven kingdoms are. The first kingdom that the Bible makes us to understand and all of, this, of these kingdoms, they all persecuted the nation Israel. The first kingdom is the Egyptian empire. The first kingdom is the Egyptian empire. The second kingdom that the Bible is talking about is the Assyrian empire. Now, if you know something about Egyptian empire, the children of Israel were in captivity for 400 years at the hands of the Egyptians and the Egyptians put them under heavy slavery until God rescued them. And when God rescued them, they came out of Egypt and they settled in the land of Cana. Now, when they settled in the land of Cana, it wasn't long that they began to disobey God. The Bible says after David and after Solomon that the kingdom of Israel, which are 12 tribes, split into two. Two tribes formed a nation called Judah and 10 of the tribes decided to call themselves Israel. But then they worshiped idols. So God warned them through Elijah and other various prophets that if they don't repent, God will send them to a captivity. But the children of Israel did not listen. So the Assyrian kingdom came and took them into captivity. And then the other two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, which live in the south, were also captured later on by another empire called the Babylonian Empire. And then after the Babylonian Empire came, the Medo-Persian Empire, which took over. As you go through the book of Daniel, there were notice Daniel mentions the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Grecian Empire. Now, I want you to, just to give you a little bit of explanation. Now, the Bible makes us to understand that the character, it, it makes us to understand the character of this Antichrist that is to come. I want to tell you that nobody knows whether the Antichrist is born or not. That's the times and the seasons we are in. It is possible he's around. It is also possible that he's not yet born. Because Jesus was in the world for 30 years and nobody knew that he was the Messiah. And if there's something about Satan, Satan likes to do photocopying because he wants to be God. Now, the beasts have all kinds of names. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 5, the beast is known as the false messiah. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, his character is mentioned there. So another name 
for the Antichrist is a false Messiah. Now, up to now, the nation Israel, many of them do not know that Jesus is the Messiah. So they go to the wailing wall, praying and say, Lord, send on the Messiah. But they're looking for a king Messiah. They're looking for one that will come and lead the nation that will be a king, that will sit on the throne. That's what they're looking for. And when Jesus came, that is why when he sat on the donkey and entered Jerusalem, they said, Hosanna, Hosanna. Here comes the king of the Jews. And they were disappointed when he was crucified and then he went away. And they thought, that can't be the Messiah. So many Jews up till now are still believing that there is a Messiah that is going to come. Because their eyes have been shut to understand the times and the seasons. But there's a time coming that their eyes will be open. The Antichrist has different names. In Daniel chapter 7 verse 8, he's called the little horn. He's called the little horn. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 36, he's called the willful king. In Daniel chapter 9 verse 26, he's called the coming prince. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3, he's called the man of sin. And don't worry, uh, it's all in the nose. So later on, when you get the nose, you could read on all of that. Now, you will notice that within the Godhead, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Some Christians struggle to understand how can there be two, pers three personalities in the Godhead. It's very simple. You yourself, you are three personalities. You are a body, you are a soul, and you are a spirit. And the Bible says God created us in his own image and in his own likeness. Now, Satan likes to copy. He likes to do photocopy. So as we study Revelation chapter 13, there will notice that in Revelation chapter 13 verse 2, he's, we are told that there is a great dragon. One of the names of Satan is the great dragon. He's called the great dragon. He's called Satan. He's called the devil. He's called the old serpent. And we learn that in Revelation chapter 12. And I want you to read Revelation chapter 13 verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, the Bible says this beast, this Antichrist, he was like a leopard, and his feet was like a bear, and his mouth was like a lion. And it was the dragon that gave him the power and his seat and his great authority. So you, you will see that Satan sees himself as the god of this world. The Antichrist will be the, the, um, the second personality in the satanic herd. And there, then there's a third personality who is called the false prophet. So you have Holy Trinity and you have unholy Trinity in the last days. Now, when the Bible says in verse 2 that this Antichrist will have the character of a leopard, he will have the character of a bear, he will have the character of a lion, and he will be empowered by the dragon. I want to explain what that, these are metaphors. And you got to understand, and to, for you to be able to understand what um, Revelation chapter 13 verse 2 is talking about, you have to go, go all the way to Daniel. Go to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 6. Daniel chapter 7, verse 6. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Stop there. Now, that scripture has already been fulfilled. The leopard was a symbol of the, Greek, the Grecian Empire, the empire of the Greeks. The Greek empire was symbolized by a leopard. And when Alexander the Great died, the Greek empire split into four. And so that's what it is talking about. Now, I want you to read Daniel chapter 7, verse 5. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, 
and it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in its mouth and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it and they said thus unto it arise devour much flesh now the bear represents the Medo persian empire of which darius and cyrus were kings at certain times now the Medo persian empire their symbol was the bear now the question is why is the bible comparing the antichrist to to these empires i will explain i wanted to go to daniel chapter 7 I want you to read verse 4. the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings i beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it now that is describing the Babylonian empire. The Babylonian empire had the lion as a symbol and it had the eagle as a symbol. You will notice now, um, I wanted to share um, the, the dream, the, the, the table on the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And um, open your Bible to Daniel chapter two. Daniel chapter two. So why are you reading Daniel? Well, Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 24 that if we read the things of the last days and we don't understand, we need to consult Daniel because he explained everything. He revealed everything to Daniel, what will happen in the last days. Now, many times when preachers preach and they make the, the statement, we live in the last days, um, can our people, people that are not spiritual and don't understand spiritual things, we just go... We've heard that all our lives that we're living in the last day that Jesus is coming soon and it has never come to pass because they lack understanding of what we're really talking about. So I want to take my time and explain. Now, for most of you, you would have gone to Sunday school and then you would have heard about that Daniel had um, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, had a dream. And in this dream, he forgot the dream. So he told the magicians and the astrologers to tell him the dream. And they couldn't tell the dream. So he was about to kill all of them. And Daniel stood up and said, King, don't be haste. Just give us some days and we will seek the Lord. We will find the dream you had and we'll give you the interpretation. And so after a few days, Daniel came back and gave the king that dream and gave the interpretation of the dream. Now, the dream was a statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. And um, there is a meaning to all this. And I wanted to pay particular attention because it's going to give you understanding why we are living in the very last days. The head of the statue is the gold. That represented the Babylonian empire of which King Nebuchadnezzar was the king. That kingdom is no more. And that part of scripture has been fulfilled. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire existed between 625 BC and 539 BC. Scripture has been fulfilled. The second part is symbolized as the silver. That's the, um, the chest and the arms. It's symbolized as the silver. And other symbols for this is the bear. I got all the scriptures there. And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 39, we are told that another king will arise after Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire, which was King Cyrus, the Persian, and Darius, the Medes. And they took over and they built another empire, which was called what? The Medo Persian what? Empire. That empire. Ruled from 539 BC to 330 BC. That has been fulfilled. The next empire is a bronze. The bronze is the waste. As you can see in the picture on your screen, is the waste. That represented the Greek empire. The Greek empire, history tells us the Greek empire has come and gone. It was out of the Greek empire, we got democracy. It was out of the Greek empire, 
We got all the scientific words that are so difficult to pronounce were all coined from the Greek language. It was in those times the Greek empire was so strong that it influenced the style, the fashion, the attitude, everything in the then known world to the point that the apostles had to write the New Testament in Greek because Greek was the number one language spoken at that time. Now, the Greek empire is no more. The next empire that took over from the Greek empire is the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is the ties and the leg. And the Roman Empire was the empire that was ruling when Jesus was born. When Jesus was born, when the apostles took the message of the gospel across Asia and Asia Minor to the then known world and across to Africa, the empire that was ruling at that time was the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire was not defeated. Now, the, Assy the Egyptian Empire was defeated by the Assyrians. The Assyrian Empire was defeated by the Babylonians. The Babylonian Empire was defeated by the Medes and Persia. The Greek Empire then defeated the Medes and the Persians, and the Romans defeated the Greeks. But when it came to the, um, the Romans, the Ro nobody defeated the Roman Empire. It just imploded for two reasons, corruption and immorality destroyed the Roman Empire, and it collapsed on its own. And every, everyone separated and became a separate nation. Now, the landscape of the Roman Empire covers the European Union plus sections of the whole of Middle East. Now, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, another empire is meant to rise up. So when you go... I wanted to read Revelation chapter 13, verse 2 again. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Stop there. That means the Antichrist is going to combine the wickedness of the Babylonians added to the wickedness of the medicine, the patients, and added to the wickedness of the Greeks. That everything Israel suffered under this empire is a joke compared to what is coming with the reign of the Antichrist. You know, because people don't study scripture in line, they think, oh yeah, they, they can cope in those times. It's not going to be an easy time. It is not going to be an easy time. And do not forget the Egyptians and do not forget the Assyrians. These were wicked empires. And the Antichrist is going to combine, Satan is going to empower this man called the Antichrist and he's going to combine all these levels of wickedness. Now, let's go back to this statue again. Now, when you look at the statue, you will then find there's feet. There's feet. And at the feet, on each feet are five toes. And five toes plus five toes is ten toes. Now, when you go to Revelation, go to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, um, the scripture we read to interpret. Um, Revelation chapter 17, and I want you to read verse 9 to 13. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. Here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman, the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen and one is. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. I can start there. The seven heads are seven mountains. These seven mountains are seven empires that have come. The first one was Egypt. The second one was Assyria. The third one was Babylon. The fourth one was Medo Persia. And the fifth one was Greece. And then the Roman Empire then came. And then it collapsed. So six of them have already come. The strange thing is, they all carry a spirit called the Babylonian spirit. The spirit of rebellion. Now, they will find in Genesis chapter 10 
that the first place that the people began to rebel against God. And they, when they decided, God gave Noah a command that he gave earlier on to Adam. He said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. But the Bible says that people refuse to spread across the planet. So they decided to build what? A tower. Now, they then built the tower. And the Bible said when God saw that the people were disobeying his command, he then decided to come down and confuse their language. I want you to go, um, just to refresh our memory of scripture, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 10, verse 8 to 10. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8 to 10. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Stop there. The beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel. Now I want you to go to Genesis chapter, chapter 11 and begin to read from verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shimnar, and they dwelt there. Now, go to verse 4. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to... Let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth and they left off to build the city. Okay, you can stop there. But you will notice that God had to intervene for his purpose to be fulfilled. He had to come and confound their language. Satan inspired this man called Nimrod. And this is where rebellion started. And rebellion is like witchcraft. The secret of all witchcraft started from here. And so all the empires continue the same trend. The principal spirit of Satan is witchcraft. And this is where it started from. So by this same spirit, Egypt operated. By this same spirit, Assyria operated. By the same spirit, Babylon operated it. Greece operated it. And as you go through history, you will be surprised that the same evil that were committed by one empire was continued. And the Bible is giving us a clue that when the Antichrist comes and takes over the world, every evil. Now, some people think, oh, we live in a civilized world. You have not seen anything. These things still goes on in the secret. Under the name of defense and under the name of Checking terrorism and things like that. People still do wicked things to people. And it still happens. But in the time of the Antichrist, it will not be hidden anymore. It will be in the open. And it's going to be a horrible time for humanity. I wanted to read Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, that is prophetic language that something is going to happen to the Antichrist that will result in something like that will be announced that he's dead. And then all of a sudden he will resurrect. You see the picture, the pattern there? Satan is trying to prove that the Antichrist is the Messiah who have died and also what? Resurrected. And the Bible says when that happened, the whole world wandered after the beast. But it was a false resurrection. 
You say, how can that be? Well, most people are not aware. But for example, people in the Freemasons, when somebody is dead, can do things in the realm of the spirit for the dead body to stand up. And then they will, they will ask the dead body all kinds of things. That is why they bury their own dead so that they can do rituals with the dead body. It is not the person speaking, but it is a spirit that the person used to operate comes inside the body and lift up the body. And the same kind of thing will happen. And because of that, many people in the world will be deceived thinking that this guy had to be the real Messiah. And the Bible says they wandered after the beast. You see, we live in a time where people don't want Christ that will cost them anything. They want Christ that doesn't cost them anything. They want to be a Christian, but they don't want to be holy. They want to be a Christian, but they want to live anyhow. Eventually, the world will have somebody like that. Because sometimes you see all over the world, the people will be um, walking on the streets, demonstrating, and saying they want well what? They want well peace. When the Antichrist comes, he will present peace. In the first three and a half years, he will present peace. And he will tell the people that he can, he, he is, the, is, the, is the prince of peace. When he is a false prince. Now, yet many people will believe that. And I want you to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 9 and 10, and I wanted to read in the Amplified uh, Classic Version. The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is through the activity and working of Satan. Stop there. The Bible says the coming of the lawless one. One of the names of the Antichrist is what? The lawless one. People don't want anything. That, that There's one that's coming that will give freedom. People to do anything they want except worship God. People want that kind of lifestyle except worship God. But it's a trick because eventually they will worship the Antichrist. And the Bible says the lawless one, the Antichrist, he will come through what? The activity and the working of who? Satan. So who empowers him? Satan empowers the Antichrist. Now you see, Satan is just trying to copy God. The Bible says that Jesus went to John the Baptist, he was baptized in water, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. And a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, in whom what? I am well pleased. What well, Satan too is saying that, my, my son is this antichrist, and I'm going to empower him to do my will. Now, keep reading. And will be attended by great power, and with all sorts of pretended miracles, and signs, and delusive marvels. All of them lie in wonder. Stop there. The Bible says that this man who will be the Antichrist will have the power to perform signs and wonders. He will have the power to do miracles that people will tend to believe. Lie in wonders, but people will believe it. Now, the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. Now, notice that many times people run after signs and wonders without the gospel. They want signs and wonders at no cost. If you tell them, you need to give your life to Jesus, you need to leave for God, I, I don't want all of that and everything. Just give me a word. Just give me a prophecy. Just give me signs and wonders. It doesn't matter where the source is coming from. And so, in these last days, we have the situation where people run after signs and wonders, not even paying attention. What is the source? Is the source coming from the Bible? Is it the source coming from God? Oh, this person does not preach the gospel. It, it, it doesn't. As long as they get a miracle, they're looking for that's all. And the Bible says at the time of the Antichrist, much of that will increase. Verse 10. And by unlimited seduction to evil and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, going to perdition because they did not welcome the truth, but refused to love it that they might be saved. Now, go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. The Bible says they worshipped the dragon who gave power unto the beast. Now, already a whole generation is being brainwashed. If you look at the movies, if you look at the lyrics of the songs, 
the R&B songs and all the rock songs and everything, the lyrics and the notion, a whole generation for the last 20 years, imagery of Satan have been put in movies in a way that has never happened before. It's been put in, you will see all kinds of musicians wearing the effigy of Satan with two horns on the head, with, with the penta pentagram, with the sex hexagram, and then they're not hiding it anymore. They, they are not hiding it anymore. And yet you will think Christians will wake up from their deep sleep. No, they will not. Because while the Christians will say, well, I saw Beyonce and he said that there's a spirit that, he's, um, that, that works with her and the spirit is called Shaka Fierce. And you'll think that they've got a message to stay away from that song. All it takes is go to the wedding. I'm, and I'm talking about Christian wedding and the very same song they were criticizing is the same song that will be sung there and you will be shocked. You got pastors, worship leaders, everybody digging it right there on the floor and everything with the same song. And then you're wondering what kind of spirit do we have? Do we have discernment? Do we understand the times and the season? Because it's brainwashing. The mindsets of the children and the generation in which we are, are being tampered with. The chief of um, MTV was asked, how are you able to capture 12 to 19 year olds into MTV? And the president, the CEO of MTV, this was his response. We don't capture them, we own them. Because they have an understanding that music is a powerful thing that sets an atmosphere for spirits to operate. I repeat, music is a powerful thing, is the, is, is the food of the soul that sets the atmosphere for spirits to operate. Have you ever wondered why evangelists always ask for certain types of music before altar call? How is it that evangelists want to pray for people that ask for certain songs? They don't just play any song. The song sets the atmosphere for the spirit of the living God to move. It's the same way. Notice that in Daniel chapter, Daniel, in, in the book of Daniel, the Bible says Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow to the, um, to the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And then he came and said, well, I've heard that you guys did not bow. Well, we're going to sound the music again. At the sound of the music, you should bow. Why do they have to play music? Because music invokes the presence of spirits. Music is a medium that the church does not realize that it's not just something that is used for the church. But the enemy too has taken inroad into music. And with, that's why we need to be very careful. You have people that are in the music ministry and they don't understand spiritual things. They don't understand spiritual. They will tell you, well, it's nothing wrong in music. You just have to learn how to sing how Michael Jackson did it before you can do gospel. Who told you? Who told you? Who told you that's how it works? And we got people here in this place doing that. And for years, they've not been able to hit anything. You cannot serve God and what? A mammon. The platform, the altar is being set to, to deceive a whole generation with these things. Now, when we get to Revelation chapter 17, I will take time and I'll go into details on that. But I want to show you, um, I wanted to keep reading Revelation chapter 13 verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Notice that they started worshipping the beast. But by worshipping the beast, worshipping the Antichrist, all of a sudden now, they're not just worshipping the Antichrist, they're worshipping who? Satan. They're worshipping the dragon who gave power unto the beast. Continue. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? They are provoking God because... It is only God that has those attributes. Now, when you go to Exodus, now I want to read this myself because of time. Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. The Bible says, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? They're comparing the Antichrist to God. In Psalm 113, verse 5. 
who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high. Have you noticed that all of a sudden in the last 10 to 15 years, we're being told that it's multi-faith. We all believe in a God. We all believe in a God. We, we, need to, we need to leave all this separation between the Christian and this faith and that faith and that faith. Let's all come together. So somebody comes, he reads from this, um, the, this religious book and the other person comes, he reads from the other religious book and, and let's amalgamate all the religions. It's the spirit of the last day because the Bible makes us to understand the whole world is heading towards one world religion. One world religion. He said, how do you know that? I want to tell you the headquarters for one world religion is already been set and is in the Netherlands and is specifically in a city called The Hague. They've already set it. And Jewish leaders, Christian leaders, Muslim leaders, Hindu leaders, all kinds of religion met there and they decided this is our goal, that we want to promote unity and this unity is going to be based on having one religion. And it all looks good on paper, but the, the spirit behind it is the spirit of what? The Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world, working. But the Antichrist himself is yet to show up. Now, I want you to read verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. Now, notice this. The Bible said it was given unto him. So you see, God is still sovereign. If God had decided that he will not allow this to happen, the Antichrist can't do anything. Satan can't do anything. Notice in Job chapter 1, the Bible makes us to understand that Satan needed permission before he could touch Job. God is still sovereign and is in charge of every sin. He hasn't lost control. He said, and there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. He began to speak blasphe blasphemous things, that he is God. He is the one that is ruling. And power was given unto him. Now we know who gave him the power, Satan. Power was given unto him to rule for 42 months. Now, 42 months is three and a half years. Three and a half years is the last three and a half years of the seven-year period. Say, so what are you talking about? I will soon explain. Now, to understand why he was given three and a half years, I want us to go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything Stop out Stop there. Of I just wanted the verse 15. Read the verse 15 again. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let, let him understand. understand. Now, that's what I was talking about. You cannot understand the end time things if you don't study the book of Daniel. If you really want to understand the book of Revelation, the first book to read is not Revelation. You need to understand Daniel. You need to understand the book of Ezekiel and Daniel to be able to interpret the book of Revelation. They are intertwined. Now, Jesus is the one speaking in Matthew chapter 24 verse 15 and is saying that what I am telling you about the end time event, if you still don't understand, you have to go to Daniel. So let's go to Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant for many with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, 
This is why I told you to go back and revise and, and, and read through Daniel chapter 7 to Daniel chapter 12 to refresh your memory of the things we studied in there. Now, he said that he will make, a, he will confirm a covenant. So you see, even the Antichrist believes in covenant. The Antichrist believes in covenant. And yet we have people telling you that um, we don't need any covenant. The Antichrist confirm a covenant for many for one week. That's prophetic language to say. Now, the one week is seven years. How do, you, how do I know that? Because the angel came to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 and explained that every one week is one week is seven days. And every day represents what? A year. It's, a, it's called the day year prophecy. So the Bible says Daniel saw 70 weeks. And the 70 weeks, you have to multiply by seven to know the years, which is 490 what? Years. And Daniel was praying in chapter 9, wanting to know the 70 years captivity in Babylon was finished. So he wanted to know what is going to be the destiny of the nation. What, what's going to happen to the nation Israel? And so the Lord decided to send an angel to come and give him an answer. But when the angel was bringing the answer, there was war in heaven. Now, I have summarized it. In a, in, a, in a simple table so that you can understand what I'm talking about. So I wanted to put Daniel's vision of the 70 weeks on the screen. Daniel's vision of the 70. Thank you. That's the one I'm looking for. Right. Okay. Now there are 70 weeks that he saw in the prophecy. The first 69 weeks, the first 69 weeks has been fulfilled, completely fulfilled in the life of the nation Israel. Now, on the diagram, you will see that seven weeks is of years. So seven weeks, you multiply seven weeks by seven years, that's 49 years. It took the nation Israel to rebuild the temple. In 49 years, you remember the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, so they had to rebuild the temple, and Nehemiah had to rebuild the walls. It took that long time. After they rebuild it, then there is 62 weeks. Those 62 weeks, 62 weeks multiplied by 7 is 400 and what? 34 years. 400 out of that 34 years is what you call in theology, 400 silent years. And the 400 silent years is between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew. Between Malachi and Matthew is 400 years God did not give a prophecy. And the other 34 years was in the days of Hagar. Hagar, um, Zechariah, and the others prophesying, telling the people to reconcile with God and live a holy life. At the end of the 434 years, then Jesus came into the world. When Jesus came, he lived for 33 years, and then he died. So you notice that the 33 years adds up to the, inside the 434. And all that has been fulfilled because we know Jesus. Now, you can see that there are days underneath, command to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, Mark 14. 445 BC, these are estimated dates. It, it can vary. Cutting off of the Messiah, April 6, AD 32, estimated date. Because people really didn't keep the calendar the way they should have. So it's estimated. But the years are correct, but the date can vary. Now, you will see where the cross is. Jesus died on the cross, resurrected, and then ascended to what? To heaven. Up until then, the disciples believed that once Jesus resurrected, he was going to set up his kingdom on the earth. I wanted to go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. When you open to Acts chapter 1, I wanted to find the verse where they asked him the question. When will thou restore the kingdom unto Israel? Because they were waiting for him to establish a kingdom like his father David had a kingdom 
and then the, the 12 disciples will become the 12 um, princes who will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Wherefore they therefore were come together. They asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? So notice that the, the disciples were not looking for a church. They wanted a restoration of the kingdom of Israel. Read in this verse, Jesus' response. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Stop there. So Jesus changed the conversation saying, it's not for you to know when the kingdom will be restored back to the nation Israel, but I want to tell you something. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's not what they asked him. He changed the conversation and then he later on tell them, tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And in Acts chapter 2, then we read that the Holy Ghost came upon them. And when the Holy Ghost came upon them, they began to speak in tongues. And when they began to speak in tongues, people began to laugh at them that they were drunk. And then Peter stood up and began to preach the gospel. That was the first time the gospel was fully preached. And when Peter preached the gospel from a New Testament perspective, because we know prophetically Abraham had the gospel first. Now, from a New Testament perspective, now when that happened, that was when the church as we know it in the New Testament was born. So between, you see that gap there, is what is called the church word age. And for, the, for over 2,000 years, we've been what in the church age. Now, the, Jesus did not tell us how long the church age will be. Nobody, no preacher, no prophet, no anybody knows how long the church age will be. But Paul warned us that we should be ready at all what? Time. At all time. Say, so behold, I speak unto you a mystery. That we shall not all die. That those that are dead shall rise up in, to meet Christ, and we that are alive shall be caught up. So they live with that agency. The early church live with that agency. They were not saying things like, oh, we don't think Jesus is coming soon because the, the gospel hasn't gone all over the world. No, 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 no. They live with that agency knowing that God, can, Christ can come on at any time. They live with that agency. In the last 25 years within the church circles, the message concerning end times are not preached anymore. Everybody wants to hear a message on prosperity. Everybody wants to get a breakthrough. Everybody wants to get a good message. and wants to get a hype message. But nobody wants to hear the truth and holiness and, and preparing for the kingdom anymore. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, that Christ Jesus is coming for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. He's coming for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. He's preparing to come to take his own out. Now, notice that the last seven years, I've put the, the Antichrist in the temple. The last seven years is split into 3.5 years, that's three and a half years, and then three and a half years. The first three and a half years is what is known as tribulation. The last three and a half years is what is known as the great tribulation. And the Bible says, now, the, at the beginning, remember in Daniel chapter 9, he's, he confirmed a covenant for what? One week. And that one week, prophetically, is seven years. But when he signed that covenant of peace for um, seven years with the nation Israel, in the middle of the seven years, that's three and a half years after, he will break. Then they will know that he's not the prince of peace they thought he was. They will know he's not the king of kings they thought he was. He's not the Messiah that everybody thought he was. And then he would then insist that everybody must get the mark. That's where the last three and a half years starts. Now, let's go back to the Bible. Revelation chapter 13, verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God 
to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Now, notice that he's pushing the envelope. He's making himself God and blaspheming against God. That is very self-explanatory what, is, what the Antichrist will do. Go to verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Ah, it was given unto him that in the time, in the last three and a half years, anybody that will be born again during the last three and a half years of his reign, it was given unto him to do what? To make war with sins and many people will be killed. Now, keep reading. And to overcome them. And to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Power will be given him that you control the world. It doesn't matter what nation. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what tribe you come from. He will exercise authority over the world. How is he going to exercise this authority? Verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That scripture is loaded because from this scripture, we know that the people in the world who are not born again, whose names are not written in the book of life, will begin to worship him. They will begin to worship him as God. But then we also learn something there. Is it the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world? Which means God had already decided in his heart because the foreknowledge and the omniscient God foreknew man will fall. And he made provision that his, his son will die as the lamp of God. He will shed his blood. The, now, for example, why is this planet? The planet is like, the planet Earth is like a football hanging in the air. What holds the planet? The blood of the lamb holds it. The blood of the lamb is the foundation of the world. Without the blood, nothing happens. Now, many times, Christians just know about the blood frivolously without understanding the depth of the blood. The blood is so important. It is the ultimate weapon against Satan. That in Revelation chapter 12, we are told in verse 11 that they overcame him by what? They overcame the dragon by the blood of the lamb. That's the ultimate power, the blood of the lamb. Because the sacrificial blood of the lamb is the blood that speaks. The blood of the lamb speaks better things than the blood of Abel. It has authority. It has power. That's why when Jesus hung on the cross and he was crucified and blood began to come out of his hand and blood began to come out of the tongues, the press into his head and out of his feet and out of his side. When the blood touched the earth, there was an earthquake. The earth responded because there are three that bear witness on the earth. The water, the blood, and the Holy Spirit. They bear witness. They bear record on the earth. And so when his blood and his water came out of his side, after the centurion pierced his body, and the, water, the earth responded to the blood. It's a mystery. The blood is a powerful weapon. If you get a time, every believer must make it as an assignment to go through the Bible and study the blood. And that will be the end of many problems many believers have. It's because of a lack of understanding of the efficacy of the blood. When you understand what the blood does, this is the same blood that was manifested prophetically in Egypt. So when I see the blood, I will do what? I will pass over. It is the ultimate weapon. It is, 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 the, is, is the most powerful offensive weapon against Satan and yet the most powerful defensive weapon for a child of God. Read verse 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Now, with everything I have spoken about, the Bible says, if any man has an ear, let him do what? Let him hear. Time is short, folks. This is not the time to have one leg in the church and one leg outside. This is not the time you need somebody to pamper you before you leave the Christian life. This is not the hour that you need. Now, next week, I am going to go into details 
in the second part of Revelation chapter 13. But I still have some, something more to share with you. And um, there's been rumors all over the world because, and the reason why these rumors catch fire is because people have not been reading their Bible. That's why it is a big deal. If people were reading their Bible, then we will not have all these problems at all. Now, I want you to go to Revelation, Revelation chapter 13. Go to the last two verses. Start reading from verse 16. Start from verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Verse 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Which is six hundred and sixty six. Now I read this scripture. And I want you to meditate on the word of God. Now, notice in verse 16, he said, He caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark where? In their right hand or in their forehead. There is so, there are so many videos on YouTube and on Facebook. And all kinds of social media on Instagram. And these people that have not been reading their Bible for years. All of a sudden, they are experts. And all of them are saying, well, well, you know, the vaccination is the mark of the Antichrist. The vaccination is the... Now, let us reason together. Let's look at scripture. The Bible says the mark will be in the right hand and in the forehead. And the vaccination is in your shoulder. I repeat, the vaccination is in your shoulder. It's not in your right hand and it's not in your forehead. Now, this is how you separate truth from what? Speculation. The vaccination is not the mark of the Antichrist. It, now, so... Many people are so scared. There's so much spirit of fear going around and people are scared of COVID-19 and this is going to happen and that's going to happen and everything. There's, it is not the mark of the Antichrist. The mark of the Antichrist will be fulfilled just as it is written. Now, the technology for this thing to be fulfilled have already been around for the last 10 years. I wrote a book on this thing. And in England, there's a private school that has a chip that was designed by Itachi, a Japanese technology company. And they've inserted the chip in school uniforms. So the children, the bank of school, that don't go to school, they say to mommy, mommy, I'm off to school. And then they'll go somewhere else to watch the movie or something like that. While you're in the movie house, there's somebody, an IT personnel in the school can locate you because the chip will tell the IT person your location, just like you have location on your cell phones and on your tablets. It will tell the location. So the school will then call your parents and say, your child did not come to school and we have located her and we have located him. He's in 169 Upper Road and he's in this house. And we believe he's there with a young man. You will be there and the police will arrive there. So the technology for these things is already there. Okay? That's what I want, it, I want to clear it up. It's not now they're developing the technology. The technology is available. And this technology, these chips are inserted into animals in the United States. So, for example, you go to a state like Texas that, that have a lot of cows and um, horses and things like that. 
And sometimes the, the, the cows will break through the fence and the farmer can't locate them. So what they do is they put chips in the cows. So if the cows escape, they just call the police. The police will use its helicopter and will locate them. Cars. It's very difficult to steal a car in a small country like Barbados because selling it will be difficult unless you take the whole thing apart. But in countries that, like the United Kingdom and the US and Europe, people steal cars. Cars is one of the things people steal. They steal it, they give it to a company, and the company ships them to Asia or, or Africa to sell. Just as fast as that. So people began to buy these chips and put it in the car. So when they wake up and they can't find their car, they call the police. While the people are with the car, the police will locate them and catch them. The chips are there. Also, for example, the Mexican special forces, they've inserted chips into their hands in case they get um, captured by the drug cartels in Mexico, then the military knows exactly where they've been kept. So these technologies, I'm trying to let you know, they've been available. In Spain, there are people that already have the experimental chip, and that's not the mark, because you cannot receive the mark before the time. I repeat, you cannot receive the mark before what? The time. They're going to improve that technology. They will improve it. Just that you have Windows, and then we had Windows SP, and we had Windows Vista. They're going to improve the technology of this chip. But the, 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 the idea, the plan is already in the system. So the point that that chip, they can code your telephone number into it, your national insurance number into it. They can code your bank account details into it. So when you go to the supermarket, you don't need a credit card. You don't need a debit card. When you finish, you just go pew, and it takes the money out of your account. And people already in Europe, parts of the country, people have got the experimental chip. When they go to the pub, they go to the restaurant, that's what they do. We are that close. So how come the Antichrist have not swum? Because the church. Because of what? The church. Now, I want you to open your Bible. I want to show you why they've not been able to take over. For example, the five open scriptures, I want to share this with you. Now, notice that last year, it was around springtime, around March and April, we went into lockdown. And when we went into lockdown, some of you would have come across all kinds of videos where a certain man stood there claiming that he wanted a vaccine that will, what do you call it, would depopulate and all of that and everything. And it there was a plan. Let's, not, let's call it spade. There was a plan that it would tamper with the whole thing, but the plan did not succeed. Because for the plan to succeed, there had to be only one, one vaccine. And I remember in the summer, we joined Apostle Fordley and we began to pray with the London Tower for 40 days. And we began to see God. And there were other prayer groups across the world that saw the same thing. And they began to see God. Now, what happened was they expected only one vaccine to come. So with one vaccine from one company, anybody can do anything that what they want. Well, God had other ideas. So what God did was Genesis chapter 11. He came down. And when he came down, he confounded their language. They could not agree. So now we have nine vaccines, nine vaccines on the market. By the next three months, there will be about 50 kinds of vaccine against COVID-19. Now, that's exactly what God did when they were building the tower. Because every time, there's always been a time Satan wants to hurry the spirit of the Antichrist, hurry the Antichrist to take over the world. But God is sovereign. It is not the set time for it to happen. And so every time he tries, as long as the children of God rises up and pray, he causes division, and commotion in their camp. And so they could not even agree how they, they will form the vaccine. Every, the, the Russians have their own vaccine. It's called the Sputnik 5. The, the, the British have their own. It's called the AstraZeneca. That's the one that is in Barbados. 
and then the Americans designed um, Pfizer and Moderna. And there's another one called Johnson, and there's another one called Novavax, and the Chinese have two. One is called um, Sinovac, and the other one, I've forgotten the name. But there are loads of them coming. And none of them, each company decided to keep his own what? Information. So they could not agree as to what to do. So the idea and the plan to influence so that they would take over and make people did not what? Succeed. Now, I want to address the issue of, so some of you might be having the questions. So, Pastor, if I take the vaccine, does that mean I don't have faith in God? No, it's not true. If you decide to take the vaccine, that's your choice. Number one, you have not committed a sin. Because you have to understand that already all of us have all kinds of vaccines what, in our body. Okay? Not all, all the vaccines were not designed the same way. For example, the AstraZeneca one that is in Barbados was designed scientifically the same way other vaccines we have in our body against poliomyelitis, against smallpox, against measles, against chickenpox, and against all these tuberculosis and weird diseases that used to kill children is the same method that they use in designing that. And because it was the same method, that medicine cost far less. But then there are other medicines that were designed in a different way. I'm not concerned about that. I want to talk about the one word that is what? In Barbados. Now, the one that is here, the AstraZeneca one that is not just in Barbados, it's being spread across Africa and um, India and other places and um, across the Caribbean and everything. That was designed the same way that the normal vaccines have been designed. Now, if you take the vaccine, now that's one thing. Does the vaccine changes your DNA? There are all kinds of videos and write-ups that once you take the vaccine, your DNA is going to be changed. You don't know much about what, who you are in Christ. Now I want to show you scripture. Listen, you are extraordinary. No man can change your DNA. And I'm going to show you scripture. Now, open your Bible. Help me, Holy Ghost. Open your Bible to 1 John chapter 3. I want you to read verse 8 and 9. First John chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. I'm dealing with the issue of whether our DNA will change if we take a vaccine. He that committeth sin is of the devil. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. Uh -huh. For this purpose, the Son of God For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The purpose of Christ Jesus coming into the world was to manifest and destroy what? The works of the devil. Now, I want you to read verse 9 slowly. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, but that doesn't end there. He goes, for his seed, the seed of God, remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he's born of God. The seed, that way there for his seed. Whose seed is that? That's the seed of God. Now, the Greek word translated as seed over there is sperma. But it comes from the word spermatozoa. But it comes from the word sperm. But because the King James English is very King James, they didn't write the word was spam there. They, write, they wrote the word was seed. Now, it is within your spam that you have what? Your DNA. That's why your child can look at like what? You. That your DNA is within that. Now, the Bible is saying that if you are born of God, you have the DNA of God inside you. And you really think that somebody, a man, can come and change your DNA. You don't know scripture. Even if they tamper with that vaccine, I want to tell you, your DNA cannot change because it is the seed of God. He that is born of God has the seed of God what? In them. There's a man. 
His name was John G. Lake. And in those times, they had a pandemic. And disease was spreading in South Africa and people were dying. They put the virus on his skin. All the virus died instantaneously. When we don't know much, we live in fear. We live in all kinds of things. We are worried what's going to happen to us. Oh, my pastor, we know of this man of God that died from, I know men of God that have died. But what I know is the revelation of scripture. His seed, what? Remains inside you. So the vaccine cannot tamper with your DNA. Let that sink in. I will give you another scripture. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his seed. Thy seed. When you get say the seed of God comes inside you, you are a unique being. Oh, don't miss Sunday service because Sunday I'll be telling you that, listen, the whole life of the Christian life you are living is a drama. It's a drama you are living because before the foundations of the world, God knew you and called you unto salvation. It's a drama. The series have already been written. All you need to do is to find out what God's plan is for your life and live that life. Do you know how many times they tried to kill Jesus before his time? And they could not, you will not die before your time in Jesus' name. You will not die before your time. The vaccine is not the mark of the Antichrist. And nobody, nobody can change your DNA. They cannot change your DNA. God has not given them the authority to be able to change your DNA. It's not the time for the spirit of the Antichrist to do whatever what it wants to do. Yet his spirit is hovering around. Today somebody sent me a message where in this country they want to digitize everybody with thumbprint and everything so that our ID card has everything inside it digitally. I want to turn the country into a police state. That is, we walking towards the rain horde of the Antichrist. So that by the time the Antichrist comes, there's no, there no hiding place. There's no, and, and there's a whole generation that don't know how to catch a chicken. That don't know how to catch a, a lamb. They've always seen lamb cut into pieces and chicken cut into pieces and put in the supermarket. How are they going to survive? This is why we need to preach the gospel. Time is short, but it is not. We are not in the era of the Antichrist yet. But we're close. We are very hot. We are very close. Now, if somebody takes medicine, does it mean he does not have faith in God? No. Because God is God that gave wisdom to men to design what? Medication. Now, remember that there was um, a home cell that we did. Scientific facts of the Bible, where I showed you that most of the scientists that brought up ideas, the guy that did electricity, the guy that did light, the guy that did sound, all of them were Christians. All of them. And I showed historical fact that they were Christians. So, don't let anybody um, put fear in your heart that you cannot think. For example, do you know that Paul Missionary Jenny, there was a doctor among them? I hope you understand that Paul the Apostle operated in all the nine gifts of the Spirit. I hope you understand that he had a gift of healing. But do you know Paul did not heal everybody? I'm going to show you in Scripture. But I want to show you a man who was a doctor. Now, he was Luke the physician. Luke the physician is the guy who wrote the book of the, the gospel according to Luke and he's the guy who wrote as, as of the Apostles. Now, I want you to read yeah, read Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, 
it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Now, go to Acts chapter 1, read verse 1 and 2. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Stop there. Notice that Luke mentioned Theophilus when he was writing the gospel according to Luke. And when he started writing the gospel according to um, the, the, the Acts of Apostles, he made, he made mention of the former treaties of the things I wrote concerning what Jesus did. Which means Acts of Apostles is a continuation of the book of Luke. Now, in Paul's missionary journeys, this man called Luke traveled with Paul the Apostle. Say, so how do you know that? For Colossians chapter 4, verse 12 to 14. Colossians chapter 4, verse 12 to 14. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Heropop Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Do you see that? Luke, the beloved what? Physician, and Demas greet you. Luke was a doctor. But he was also a Christian. So was Luke, was that contradictory? No, he wasn't. Luke was a doctor. He was a doctor. He was a physician. He was a GP. And he traveled with Paul on the missionary journeys. Now, when he traveled with Paul on the missionary journeys, sometimes some of the people in the missionary team got sick. And then they would need somebody to look after them. And guess what? Their beloved physician will be there what? to look after them. Now I'm going to give you examples of those situations. Um, go to Acts 21, verse 29. Acts 21, verse 29. For they had seen before with him in the city of Trophimus an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple. Now, there's a name I wanted to pay attention to. It said Trophimus was there. Trophimus was the Ephesian. Okay, now go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. Eratus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Meletus sick. Now, notice that it said Eratus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus, who was with Paul, they left him where? They left him at Meletus. Why? Because he was what? He was sick. So who did they le left him with? Look, the physician. The question is, why didn't they didn't Paul lay hands on Trophimus to be healed? Didn't Paul lay hands on Trophimus to be healed? But the thing is, he didn't. Or maybe he lay hands on him or he prayed for him, but Trophimus was still sick. So what did they do? By wisdom, they left him to be looked after. Look, the physician. Now, I want to read another scripture. Acts chapter 20, verse 4 to 7. And they accompany him into Asia, Sapata of Beria, and of the Thessalonica, and Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and of Asia, and Ty Tychicus, and Trophimus. So Trophimus was always part of what? The, um, the apostolic group that went on missions with Paul. But he got sick. And when he got sick, 
he had to be looked after. And when anybody was sick, the person that looked after them was look the physician. So for example, you are there as a child of God, you get sick. The church is praying for you and then you are taken to the hospital. It's not a sin. So is that not a lack of faith? No, because Paul the apostle did not see it as a lack of faith. The apostles to the Gentiles he didn't see it as a lack of faith because medicine too, God provided that. Now, I'll give you another scripture of another man within the company of Paul who got very sick that they even thought he was going to die. Go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Ephroditus, my brother, and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him. And Stop there. Which means that he did not receive instantaneous word, healing. He was sick for a while. Most likely they were praying, they were calling upon God and everything. But while they were praying to look, the physician have to still look after him to keep him alive. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's because we don't take time to study the word of God. You see, too many Christians have one biased view about what the Bible is talking about. And it's very sad because we don't like Bible study. We like, we like laying of hands. We like prophecy. We don't like to study. But the, Jesus said, study to show yourself what? A Paul said, study to show yourself approved. Jesus said, Search the scriptures, for in them ye have one eternal life. You need to study scripture in context, not just finding scriptures by saying, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Study the whole thing in context so you have a proper view of what the Bible is talking about. He was very sick, nearly unto death. So it was for a while. He didn't receive instantaneous healing. And these are, so you got to understand that when it comes to the miraculous, God is the sovereign power. Men of God don't have power, you know. God is, that's why in a healing service, you will see people jump out of wheelchairs, blind eyes open, lame walk. You'll see all kinds of things. And yet still, you will see 10 people who came in a wheelchair and went back in a wheelchair. You can't explain that. It's according to the sovereign one power of God. So please, let's have understanding. I will show you another scripture. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. Use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Ah, now, Paul the apostle called Timothy his son because he raised him up in the ministry. Now, Timothy had problems with his belly. Timothy was raised in the city by his grandmother. And they, they live, he was a city boy who, who went to pastor a church in the countryside. And the water in the city and the water in the countryside were not the same thing when you read the history. So every time they bring the water and Timothy drinks the water, Timothy will have, he has a belly in a Beijing way. He had a belly. So it was always right. Can you imagine preaching the gospel and then you have to tell the congregation, excuse me, congregation, I need to go to the toilet. So Paul the apostle had to write him a letter and say, this, your belly issue is becoming too much. I am sure they had prayed. I'm sure they have bind. They've commanded. But this time, Paul didn't say, anoint yourself and be healed. He said something that is uncommon. He said, drink no longer water. That means don't drink that kind of water. But what you do is, when they bring the water, take wine. Pour the wine into the water so that the water will be purified because alcohol kills germs. You see, when you don't understand the Bible, so people use this as license. And say, ah, for my stomach's sake, let me have some Malibu. That's not what the scripture is talking about. It was a health issue. 
take a little wine for your stomach's sake and thy own what infirmity. So Timothy did not only have stomach troubles, he also had all kinds of sicknesses that they've been praying. And the thing was not. So they said, listen, it's got to do with what the water you're drinking and the food you're hot, you're eating. And they corrected that. They corrected that by teaching him about the process of purification. In chemistry, it's called distillation. Where you, you add alcohol to the water to, to distill the water. That's the, the water that comes out through, through your pipe. It goes through the same process. They add chemicals to the water. They add chlorine to the water. Why? So that the chlorine will kill the bacteria before it gets to. In those days, the water had no chlorine inside. So the suggestion Paul gave was that. He didn't receive divine healing. He gave him that which was medicinal. So taking medicine and taking an injection is not the same. Now, however, if you also decide a pastor, I've read so much about these vaccines and I'm worried about what their side effects was. Ah, so I have decided not to take the vaccine. You are within your right because we have liberty what in Christ Jesus. You can decide not to take the vaccine. You also have not committed sin. I just want to bring clarity in the word of God. I wanted to bring clarity to believers. So believers, stop judging each other and talking nonsense on Facebook and all of that. That's not how the Bible works. And then those that are peddling falsehood, that, that the mark of the Antichrist is here, they are forcing this, they put it in the, in the vaccination. No. That time is not yet, but the technology for it is here. And today, I read in the news, that in this country, they want to do digital ID cards and put everybody on. That is the spirit of the Antichrist. That is the spirit of control. We're heading towards that time. So yes, those things are happening all across the world. For example, within the next six months, all across the world, if you don't have a vaccination, you will not be able, those of you that like to go for shopping in Miami, you're done. All the businessmen that like to go to Trinidad to buy cheap shirts and shoes and bring it to Barbados. That's it. No plane will be taking you. Now, so that's, that's what it's going to become. Already in Israel, if you don't have a vaccination pass, you can't go to a supermarket, you can't go to, you cannot go to a cinema, you can't go anywhere. That's how it's going to be. So you need to know where scripture stands. Not speculation and fear. And stand on the word of God. If you decide not to take the vaccination, you are redeeming your rights. Don't let anybody force you to do something you don't want to, want to do. Just like somebody like lamb, others like chicken. You make your choice. But what I want to make it clear is it's not the mark of the Antichrist. It's not. And number two, it will not change your DNA. Because you already have the DNA of God inside you. It will not change. Nobody can change the DNA of God. It cannot. It's not possible. It is not possible. You are fearfully and wonderfully what? Made. Now, do you understand the mystery of salvation? That before the foundation of the world, God called you and predestinated you unto salvation. You think God didn't know that in 2020 and 2021 there will be COVID-19 and did not make plans to protect you? God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of sound word, mind. All you need to do is watch and pray. Keep your eyes open. Because more things are on the way coming in the world. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. Prepare your heart so that when Jesus appears, you're off. Out of this world. That's what you need to concentrate on. Because you can watch all these videos and still live anyhow and still miss it when Jesus comes. What would be the point? I want to stop here and I'll continue next week. I'll continue next week and I'll go into detail what is going to happen in the reign of the Antichrist. I want you to bow down your heads. Whatever you're doing at home, stop and just spend time to pray. But this is the prayer I wanted to pray. Say, Lord, help me. Help me to be able to prepare so that I will not be in a situation
that I never planned for. Lift up your voice and begin to pray. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Lift up your voice and begin to pray. I wanted to pray for yourself. Ask the Lord to help you to stand in holiness. Ask the Lord to help you to stand in righteousness. Paul the apostle was waiting for the coming of the Lord. Peter was waiting for the coming of the Lord. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and said, and we, that our life shall be caught up. He didn't say they that will be alive. He said we, that are alive. So the, the, the apostles, the disciples, they all waited. The early believers waited for his coming. We don't know when he's coming. The Bible says you'll come as a thief in the night. That means there's an element of surprise. An element of surprise. In a twinkle of an eye, there's no time to repent. There's no time to change your mind. There's no time to meditate. There's no time to do anything. But this is the time. This is the day of salvation. This is the time to make a decision for Christ. Lift up your voice and pray for yourself. If you don't know how to pray and you are not born again, this is what you do. Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. The Bible says a broken and a contrite spirit. God will not reject. It's not how long you pray, how, how much you roll on the floor, but how sincere you are in the prayer. The Bible said the thief on the cross, he sought God and he said, that shall be with me in paradise. That's all it takes. If your heart is sincere, call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. Has the Lord to cover you in this uncertain time? In this uncertain time, lift up your voice and begin to pray. And say, Lord, I come unto you in the name of Jesus. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you tonight. And we ask, oh God, that let knowledge, understanding, and wisdom permeate our soul. Help us to prepare for the days that are coming. Help us to prepare for the coming of the Lord. In this time and in this season, that when the trumpet sounds, we will not be left behind. When the trumpet sounds, we will not be found wanting. Because Christ is coming for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. He's coming for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Lift up your voice and begin to pray. Zakala kutori yana mazibra nde kana mabaya. Malabra kante kotori mazendaya. Le kabra kato zuri yana mazebra. My father, I pray. And I bring everybody at the sound of my voice. And I pray. And I come again. That spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of fear. That is peddling your children. I command that spirit of fear to lift this load off the shoulders of your children. Tonight in the name of Jesus. I break the siege of the enemy in the name of Jesus. Satan, it is not your hour. Antichrist, this is not your hour. The church with the Holy Ghost is still here. You shall not rule in this time and in this season. Therefore, I make a decree in the name of Jesus. The fear shall not continue to rule in the heart of believers in the island. Fear shall not continue to rule the heart of ministers in the island. Fear shall not come to rule the house of believers across the world. My God and my Lord, increase the faith of yours, O God, in the heart of your people in the name of Jesus. In this uncertain time. And let your name be glorified in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise for tonight in the name of Jesus. My Lord and my God, even as we go through page by page, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, Holy Spirit divine, we ask the Lord, you open up the scriptures unto us. You bring us revelation and understanding that our lives will never be the same again. Lord, I pray that even tonight, Begin to give revelation and understanding to your children. Begin to give them visitations in the name of Jesus. This is the hour where we need your visitation. Let the angels visit them in their dream. Let the angels visit them in vision. Open up the scriptures to them. Let the scales fall out of their eye. Let revelation knowledge come unto them. In this time and in this season, that they will not be tossed about by every wind of doctrine in the name of Jesus. Let your name be glorified, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.